a combination of those two approaches, educating so that people understand what these algorithms are doing, as well as positioning them to really be accelerators of the physician's day-to-day -day activities and not seen as a replacement are key to the adoption of these technologies. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Today's guest is Dr. Dana E. Rollison, Vice President, Chief Data Officer, and Associate Center Director of Data Science at Moffitt Cancer Center. Dana has been with Moffitt for over 16 years, and while her roles have changed over the years, her mission has always remained the same, to help prevent and find a cure for cancer. Today, Dana leverages her dual role as CDO and ACD to help accelerate scientific discovery through data in pursuit of this worthy mission. On this episode, Dana joins Cindy to discuss the research going on at Moffitt and what makes their cancer center unique. Dana also shares her win-win approach to data collection and how she integrates data into every step of the research process. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for you to use search and AI to analyze your company's data, lightning fast. Business people at companies like Walmart, Hulu, and 7-Eleven use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can too. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. This week on The Data Chief, I'm so excited to introduce you to and somebody I'm meeting for the first time, Dana Rollison from Tampa. Welcome, Dana. Thank you, Cindy. It's great to meet you as well. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about the Moffitt Center for those who are not familiar with it. So Moffitt Cancer Center is the only National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center in the state of Florida. We are a care and research facility. So it has a very interesting history that I'm, I'm really proud to talk about because it's inspiring and it in, inspires the work that I do as, as well as my colleagues. H. Lee Moffitt was actually the Speaker of the House for the Florida Legislature. And in the early 80s, he had three very dear friends of his contract cancer and actually pass away from cancer in a very close time period. And unfortunately, at the time, there was no research institute offering cutting edge cancer clinical trials in the state of Florida. And this was a travesty because Florida is the third most populous state in the United States. So how could we not have a facility to treat cancer? And his friends had to leave the state for their treatment. So he actually had put into state legislature that our research institute and hospital should be the state's cancer center. 30 plus years later is very involved with the cancer center. And we have a singular mission to prevent and cure cancer. And our focus is on that every single day. We have an inpatient facility that treats uh, obviously cancer inpatients. We have an outpatient clinic both uh, on our main campus, which is on the University of South Florida campus in Tampa, as well as several satellite locations. We have a partnership with Advent Health. And then we have a research institute, which I mentioned is National Cancer Institute designated. It covers research from the basic sciences through the clinical sciences, through the population sciences and the quantitative sciences. And our niche is translational research. So we're conducting research that can benefit our patients and that can be immediately translated into improving care and outcomes. That's awesome. So prevent, but also cure and improve care. And so this is one of our connections that I only discovered uh, today that you also serve on the data governance committee for CancerLink. Is that right? I, I, I did for many years. I believe that committee disbanded in its old format, um, but I was on that committee for several years, yes. 
Okay. So Cancer Link is one of my favorite. It's a ThoughtSpot customer, and I just love anything related to data for good. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge undertaking to try to bring data from different cancer centers together with the goal of care. So, um, Absolutely. And, and quality as well. Quality benchmarking and ensuring that it's not just the top performing academic medical centers that are delivering high quality care, but that, that that care is being disseminated into the community so that everyone has access to high quality cancer care. For sure. So we'll talk about care. And you, you made an interesting comment that uh, with with another connection, a, a panel that you were on with one of my colleagues in the industry, the Caserta Group, and you talked about how patient outcomes are what matter at the end, and that really healthcare leaders need to invest in their data now in order to see success in the future. That was 2019. Here we are, 2020. We're having a lot of challenges around healthcare and care as it relates to COVID in general. Did we invest too little too late or what are your thoughts related to this? I, I think that we are on the right path toward investing in data. The challenges specifically related to cancer and data are that the way we document how patients are doing with their disease in the electronic medical records is fairly complicated compared to how we may document how someone with diabetes or heart disease is doing. Uh, those types of chronic illnesses can be more easily tracked through laboratory measurements that are more easily aggregated across different centers. So some of the efforts to harmonize capturing of data across medical records and sharing data through health information exchanges, I think has gone a long way toward improving outcomes with those chronic illnesses. Cancer is a little more complicated. It often involves imaging tests or other circulating biomarkers. It's very disease specific. And so it's more difficult to exchange information across centers and to actually leverage the data that we capture as part of taking care of patients for research and discovery. So I think initiatives like the Cancer Link that you mentioned and others that are working towards standardizing how we collect cancer data so that we can truly learn from each other's experiences and improve outcomes is, is a work in progress and something we should definitely continue to advance. There are aspects of outcomes in cancer that I think are untapped and I'd like to see progress in these areas accelerated and that's around patient reported outcomes. So we all know that cancer treatment itself can be toxic and has side effects. And we want to make sure that we're offering patients a clear understanding of the treatment choices, not just in terms of improving survival, but also the impacts on quality of life. And the more broadly we can be capturing patient reported quality of life, doing it in a standardized way that we can aggregate then across centers, the more we'll learn about the true impacts of the treatments on quality of life and be able to educate patients as to the trade-offs between sometimes survival and quality of life as they're making these treatment decisions. Yeah, absolutely. So there's two things there that I'd like to explore. One, you said the imaging, and I understand that you recently designated or, or hired somebody in, in charge of AI so that you can better leverage the imaging here. Is, are, are you finding that the doctor's trust the AI or how are you facilitating the building of that trust of how to use AI plus the human? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it, it's a very interesting area to, to talk about both in terms of technology as well as human nature, right? And, and Ross Mitchell, who is our AI officer that, that we hired about a year and a half ago, thinks a lot about this. And it, it's not just how accurate the, the algorithm is, but also how well the physicians understand it. They're less likely to trust a black box 
um, if they understand what's behind the black box, then they may be more inclined to use it. Uh, so I think education is one aspect, and we actually, uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, was canceled, but we're planning to reschedule it, have form formed a machine learning symposium at Moffitt Cancer Center designed really with the clinician in mind to, to understand what goes into creating these algorithms uh, so that when they are translated into the clinic, there's more of a buy-in because they're not so much of an unknown or a black box. But the other key is that this is just a tool. AI is just a tool. It, it, it doesn't replace the human at all. I think about some of our hematopathologists, some of whom I collaborate with on research studies, and some of their time is spent literally counting the number of cells that meet certain criteria. This is an activity that could be done with AI. It doesn't need to be done by a human. And then their brain power can be reserved for the truly important clinical interpretation of those numbers and the treatment recommendations. So I think there are clear pieces of the workflows in the, in, whether it's a radiologist or a pathologist working with images that, that AI can be used to, to really have them working as we say top of license. Um, how do we create that, that efficiency so that they're truly leveraging their skills and their experience and the knowledge they've gained over many years to, to inform treatment decisions. And I think the combination of those two approaches, educating so that people understand what these algorithms are doing and how they're created, how they're validated, as well as uh, positioning them to really be accelerators of the physician's day-to-day -day activities and not seen as a replacement are key to the adoption of these technologies. Definitely. So yeah, I don't believe AI is a replacement. It's AI plus the human. And so this, this machine learning symposium, so educating people in the private sector, somebody might say an executive AI 101 or machine learning boot camp. Um, if I think about how you also were talking about getting patients to report their outcomes or quality of life. I think of both of these as a kind of data literacy or data fluency efforts. The, the more people understand what you're going to do with that or why it matters, it helps in the data collection and the use of the AI. How are we doing here? Is it still such an uphill battle or are people gradually saying, I get it, I understand why I need to do this? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great question, Cindy, because there are many different reactions people have to data sharing, collecting their data, sharing their data. And it, it sometimes comes down to an understanding of what we're doing technically, but also what we're doing in terms of who we're sharing the data with and how are we using the data and what will ultimately become of their data. So for example, we have a protocol at Moffitt called Total Cancer Care. It seeks to enroll every patient who comes through the door in a research study. It's an opportunity for every patient to contribute to the growing knowledge of cancer research that hopefully will benefit them in their treatment journey, um, but if not, can benefit future patients as well. And not everyone will be eligible for a clinical trial per se, but using people's experiences, their data to learn and find new prevention and treatment strategies is what we're all about at Moffitt. So if we position it in that light, where we, we see that patients at a very high percentage participate in the total cancer care protocol because they are interested in, in having our researchers learn from their data. If we are asking them to specifically provide information to us for research, it definitely helps to explain to them why we're asking specific questions. They're more likely to give thought to the completeness of their answer. If we're asking them to recall family history or some exposures they've encountered in the past, if they know why we're collecting the data, that it can both help 
us treat their cancer better, but also help learn about what may have caused their cancer or what may be a predictor of how they do with their cancer that can help others, then I think people are more likely to to take care in the completeness of the response and not view it as a, an administrative burden to fill out this form, shall we say. Yeah, so imp- uh, having the data used for their benefit, sometimes mm-hmm. I call it relevancy or with them, what's in it for me, helps improve the quality of the data. But there mm-hmm. has to be a high degree of trust that they're giving you this. So are they mm-hmm. only giving it to Moffitt or do you provide it with other groups doing research? So for those who sign the total cancer care consent, part of what they are authorizing Moffitt's researchers to do is to work with other researchers, whether they be at other centers uh, throughout the country, academic medical centers, or even industry partners. We may not have enough numbers just in terms of sample size to do some of the types of algorithm building activities that we aspire to do. And so there's strength in numbers and and having people allow us to pool their data with other centers is a way of enabling these big data initiatives. Yeah, that's great. So they trust you and they trust you when you pass it on to these other centers or to the AI tech companies. I'm guessing at that point you are anonymizing it. Within the center, you keep it at the individual patient level or what happens? So all of the data sharing is is tightly regulated by the Institutional Review Board approvals. If the research can be done with anonymous data, then it is absolutely done with anonymous data. There are certain research questions where you might want to contact patients to get patient reported outcomes. That makes sense. And I think this is where we've had such challenges as it relates to healthcare data. I I look at um, in the UK, for example, they've had two failed attempts now on their second attempt to to get to um, a common medical database. In the US, we've never even tempted it again because of fear of privacy in Australia, they tried it once and realized that some of the records were not adequately anonymized or de-identified. It's challenging. I I just find that a little bit frustrating that the researchers who are, are truly trying to use these data to better our war on cancer are running up against more barriers than other industries do around using data for generating profits. So I think it's an interesting sociological question. And I do understand, uh, obviously, concerns around privacy. You don't want the data used for discrimination. There's concerns around insurance companies getting hands on those data. Uh, But at the same time, it is true that more and more of our data are shared with without our, our our knowledge. So the other interesting thing is, so you're leading edge in an industry that actually lags. So when I look at different data and analytics maturity models, one of the ones at Gartner has healthcare as lagging in terms of data and analytics maturity. And yet, the Moffitt Center seems to be leading here. How have you made that happen? And and I do see you've been there for a long time. Is that part of the secret to success in having an impact with data? Well, you're right, Cindy. I've been at Moffitt quite a while, 16 years <laughs> at this point. I, I came from Johns Hopkins as a full-time research faculty member and began working with our data in the cancer registry and I mentioned our total cancer care protocol that started in 2008 was really the catalyst for beginning to link data across our source systems. So that's when we began to link cancer registry with electronic medical records, with patient reported data, with our biobanking data on the tumors that we were collecting and the genotyping information we were getting from those tumors. And it really propelled Moffitt, I think, to 
go down this road of central data curation and investing in the, the data infrastructure as an asset in order to advance our research mission. But, but we also had a vision for how data would be used to improve clinical effectiveness, improve outcomes on the clinical side, as well as for operational use as we think about alternative payment models and trying to predict variation in costs based on clinical factors at the time of diagnosis. So we recognize that if we could invest in the curation of much of our data centrally, that this could really advance both our research mission as well as our clinical practice. And that was the advent of our electronic data warehouse, which, as you point out, healthcare was a little lagging behind other industries, but we were one of the first major cancer centers to implement the electronic data warehouse. Uh, we've since expanded it to include molecular data, and now we're moving it into the cloud to work better with unstructured data. And I think one of the reasons Moffitt has been a leader in this area is, is of course, the total cancer care protocol and that it was the catalyst and it provided the consent, the patient consent to, to link data freely across uh, different organizations, but also because we're a freestanding cancer center and some of the other matrix uh, cancer centers are, uh, it, the research enterprise exists separate from the hospital enterprise, which is a separate organization. So it becomes difficult to align with the information technology groups and to share data because of the strict regulations in sharing data and because of the different organizational structures of having IT in one organization and the research is in another. So at Moffitt, because we are all under the same umbrella, we're able to align our data strategy with both the research and the clinical uh, areas of our operations, as well as the business side. And so my dual role as Chief Data Officer and Associate Center Director of Data Science allows us to leverage our investment across the institution in data to further the research mission and the translation back into the clinic. So being integrated and also that you, so your your original training. So here was our other connection. Um, go Canes! Oh, okay. <laughs> you, not with me, my daughter. Many football games. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> yes, but you. So having coming from the field, not of data, but as a um, epidemiologist and by I can't even pronounce the word. You're going to have to pronounce it for me. How do you say virologist? Mm hmm. The virologist, yes. Thank you. You have the background, you have the domain expertise to know how data can be brought to bear on a problem. Um, do you think that helped that as you're trying to sell the use of data to people that are really most concerned about patient outcomes, that that helped you be at the forefront in terms of data and healthcare? I definitely think my epidemiologic training was a big advantage for me coming into this field of big data, if you will. And that's because epidemiology is by definition observational research. We take data that exist and draw inferences from it. Sometimes we're collecting data specifically for a study, but often we're leveraging secondary data for analysis. That's what we're trained to do. And there are all sorts of biases that have to be accounted for. There's missing data. There are a number of considerations that go into observational data analysis that I think were key considerations in how we devised our data strategy at Moffitt. So when you think about how are you going to use billing data and electronic medical record data and a variety of other data sources that exist, and how are you going to link them together? And what pockets of data would be missing? And who are you inadvertently excluding because you don't have complete data on everyone? And how then do the inferences you draw from your results impact patients that weren't included? or how are your results potentially biased by the people who were included 
by virtue of the fact that you had the data available for them. Those are the types of questions that an epidemiologist is trained to think of that may not be something who has more uh, technical training thinks of. And that's why when I was asked to serve as the chief data officer and, and work alongside Mark Holes, who was the chief information officer at the time at Moffitt, is now the chief digital officer at City of Hope. It was really a, a tag team approach. We felt like we were partners in crime. He brought the information technology expertise and I brought the observational study, the epidemiologic expertise, really the big data analysis expertise, I would say. And together we built a system that met the needs of the research community as well as the clinical community and then continued to build on that. So a tag team approach is wonderful. I think everyone wants that. They hope for that. Mm -hmm. They work for that. And it falls apart. <laughs> so what advice would you give somebody who's a CDO in any sector if they're struggling to work with IT or even somebody from the business who just knows that data can be brought to bear on a problem and yet they can't connect the technical dots to make that happen? So that is a common problem, Cindy. I think that, and this is also another way in which my training as an epidemiologist comes into play, it's, it's what we call a team science approach in the research world. Nobody has all of the knowledge or expertise to tackle a complex problem. It's those who can bring together the group of experts to tackle that problem that are going to be successful. So you have to know a little bit about all of those areas you're trying to bring together, enough to speak the language of those different team members and to relate to them about what it is you're trying to do and what role you think they can play, the value they bring to the table. And if you get people excited about the common goal you're working toward and they see how their contribution is unique and valued, then you're more likely to get their buy-in. When it comes to specific team members, whether they're in IT or on the business side, I think one challenge we run across is, is priorities. You may be working with someone in IT who has a different priority and they don't have the resources necessarily to work on which you'd like them to work on. So there the key is to, to work, and, and this is, uh, takes some time and relationship building, but to work on common priorities. Is there a way that you can build toward a common goal that will benefit both areas? And finding quick wins, if you will, will also help bring along the business side. So how can you leverage data to address a, a key question of per potentially identifying some cost savings or improving some outcomes or making a day-to-day -day activity a little bit easier because you've automated a process or you've provided a dashboard that lends visibility into data that they didn't have before. And if you can identify those, those projects or initiatives that have a clear ROI for those business constituents and can also help maybe build an infrastructure that is common across the data and the IT enterprise, then it behooves everybody to come together and collaborate and to build on the resources uh, that will benefit all three teams moving into the future. So it's, it's not easy. A lot of it's leading through influence. Uh, we throw that term out all the time, but I, I've never had a big team myself. I've always relied on collaboration with our IT partners, with my research partners, with my clinical partners. And I, I think that's actually what makes my job so rewarding is when you can bring the team into a room, you can show the vision of what we're trying to do as a team, articulate what each person brings to the table, how it really does align with their day-to-day -day work and their own priorities, and create something that none of the individual teams could ever have done on their own. That's when the magic happens. Yeah, that's great. So you also mentioned cloud, you're moving to cloud. And given the challenges of 2020 and that we see data and analytics is so important um, 
for economic recovery, for to speed to insight. And yet many organizations are risk averse when it comes to data in the cloud, particularly in healthcare. What are your thoughts on this? It's true we're risk averse, and and that is because we're so heavily regulated as an industry. Uh, Also, the the public perception comes into play. We've seen some cloud-based, even health research initiatives in the paper because of the public reacting and how the data were being used, how the patient's data were being used. Even if there is nothing illegal being done. There is a public perception issue. And I think that has been a challenge about sharing data in the cloud as much as the regulatory aspects themselves. So you want to be very careful, again, about how you're using the patient data, communicating to the patients how you're using their data. But if you don't have a supercomputing center uh, that can cost millions of dollars in capital, the cloud is a good option. Now that said, you have to have all of the assurances in place. It puts a lot more responsibility on the individual center to maintain all of the security of the data because so many of the configuration options are in your control. Uh, But having the IT folks on board who are familiar with cloud and having a compliance office involved every step of the way and the auditing internal auditing group can ensure that you roll it out in a way that is perfectly safe in terms of data privacy and security. So the security is there. You get the benefit of more compute, agility. Mm -hmm. Do you think cloud is more expensive or just differently expensive? And how do you control cloud costs for that really powerful AI algorithm (laughs) that's going to do the better image processing? That's a great question that I don't have the answer to just yet because we haven't fully moved to the cloud to be able to directly compare costs. In some scenarios, it may actually be more expensive. I will say the other benefit for us for moving to the cloud that's a little bit specific to our our use case is that our EMR vendor, our electronic medical record vendor, is rebuilding their infrastructure using a particular cloud vendor's technology. And having the compute close to the data may actually have some technical advantages, particularly when we're working with medical images and text from the electronic medical record, and we're seeking to bring results from the algorithms back into the point of care. So that was another consideration for us. So when you talk about bringing results data back to the point of care, somebody in healthcare said to me, yeah, at the point of care, people prefer to wait a long time and look at peer-reviewed scholarly articles rather than getting data, maybe the near real time, what treatment worked better for this particular type of cancer. How do we change the thinking at the point of care to better leverage data? Well, I think that evidence-based care is certainly very important. We want to make sure there's evidence behind the treatments that we're prescribing. Where I see analytics pushing the envelope uh, is twofold. One, in better processing the data that we're capturing from the patient so that the clinician can see the data in a new way and be able to better prescribe that evidence-based care. So for example, using natural language processing to, to troll through outside records that are scanned as images and pull out key pieces of information on past treatment or the cancer characteristics so that that patient can be more efficiently matched to a clinical trial if the standard of care doesn't exist is 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 important. Uh, our clinical pathways tool is a tool that aids our physicians in selecting the Moffitt clinical pathway appropriate for that particular cancer. Many of the data required to feed into that tool are not discrete. So Analytics can help in data curation, if you will, at the point of care. 
And to your point, sometimes the information on our past patients can be used to inform treatment on our current patients when there is no literature to consult. So for example, we have a clinical genomics action committee that looks at the sequencing results from a cancer patient's tumor. And if the cancer patients have failed conventional therapy and are on their fourth or fifth line of treatment and really have no treatment options left, there can be utility in looking at the different signaling pathways or mutations that are active in the tumor and seeing if other patients in our Moffitt history have had similar mutations, maybe in a different cancer. And if so, did a particular drug work for that patient? Because that could be a clue for what could work for this patient. And that's sort of a almost a last resort, if you will, but having those data available to us through hundreds of thousands of patients may provide that glimmer of hope for the patient sitting in front of us today. That's fascinating. So pivoting a bit, you were one of the first CDOs in healthcare, actually in the data and analytics industry, So this is going back to 2011, I believe. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how did who did you compare notes with, or how how do you keep abreast of everything? How much do you stay in the healthcare uh, network of CDOs, or do you look to other industries for inspiration? That's a great question, Cindy. When I took the role, we initially titled it a chief health information officer. So for a few years, I was the CHEO, is what they (laughs) called me. And it was interesting because I would go to various meetings and say, I'm the chief health information officer, and people would immediately assume I I was in IT. And so I would say, well, no, I'm not, I'm not in IT. I'm actually trained as an epidemiologist, I think about how we can link data together to inform analyses and decision-making and cross-check populations. And, you know, I could go on and on and on and they'd look at me like, okay, um, yeah, that's not what I thought you did based on your title. And so I used to then just abbreviate it and say, well, I'm, I'm the chief health information officer, but I'm not in IT. I think about data. I'm all about data. And then eventually I just thought, well, why not change it to chief data officer rather than chief health information officer? And at the time, we also brought in a chief medical information officer, which we had not had before. So we had a CMIO and a CHIO and a CIO and thought, okay, we need, we need to change this up. And so um, the, the title was changed to chief data officer. But it was also based on the recognition that increasingly the role was about data governance as much as it was about the information architecture for our enterprise data warehouse. And so not only who has access to data, back to some of our previous discussion points, but also how do we collect data? How do we standardize the collection of data? How do we put governance in place for what smoking field we're going to define as the single source of truth across the center, even though we capture it in five different ways and five different systems. So increasingly, the the role grow, grew into data governance as much as information architecture. And, you know, the industry was changing all throughout as well. So to, to your question about who did I look to, It wasn't a specific person, but rather just participating in different circles to understand what did a chief health information officer or chief data officer do at at these other organizations? How is that similar or different to my role? What were they looking to advance on the research side versus the clinical side? Because again, our organization's fairly unique in its structure that we have both. So I I go to research meetings. There's a uh, certainly American Association for Cancer Research or American Society for Clinical Oncology that, of course, CancerLink grew out of ASCO, as well as there's a Cancer Informatics for Cancer Centers group that is 
my peers in terms of research information officers. And then I actually, it was about two years ago that I struck outside of the the cancer community and went to my first chief data and analytics officer exchange. That's actually where I met Joe Caserta. And I went outside of the cancer community because I wanted to understand where the puck was going in terms of handling unstructured data and where did we need to take our electronic data warehouse into the future. And you know, that's where I learned more about some of the, the cloud-based models that other industries were leveraging, as well as how to set up the advanced analytics and the AI ML programs to show quick wins, if you will, for the business side and demonstrate value for the analytics organization overall. So I found that to be very helpful in strategizing long-term about where we were going, especially since, as you say, healthcare is behind the other industries. So I think looking to the other industries is important. But then, of course, because healthcare is unique and, and research, even within that, uh, continuing to network in, in my, amongst my peers in those settings is equally important. Yeah, I think it's important to look in your industry, but also outside for inspiration, what wor- works, what doesn't work. You just mentioned data governance. You've mentioned it a few times, and yet <laughs> some people, you use that word, it's almost like a bad word because it's so important, but nobody really wants to own it. Ha- and you talk about an example with capturing smoking. Are you a smoker or aren't you a smoker? And it exists in so many different places, and yet it's a really important attribute. How have you gotten people to understand, own, and if we dare say, get excited about data governance? Well, at, at Moffitt, data governance, and I think in other places as well, is quite a distributed process. So there are data owners, if you will, in different areas of the organization. Sometimes those are defined by uh, functional areas, sometimes defined by the actual source systems that they control. And the value of Linking data across systems, I think, is really where people start to get excited about governance because they understand if we if we are able to take information in the billing system, the scheduling system, the electronic medical records themselves, the cancer registry, and we're able to glean insights that support the marketing team, that support the clinical pathways team, that support the payer strategies team, in addition to personalized medicine and research, people start getting excited about that vision. And and if you can then tie that vision to some practical challenges around, well, if we want our systems to talk to each other and we can combine data, then we need to be thinking through the details of, of what your group is calling smoking versus this group. And often those requirements are driven by external factors. They're they're needing to report out to a regulatory body in the cancer registry case, or we're limited to the permissible values that this particular software platform has out of the box. And so if you start to understand why people collect data the certain way, and then engage them in a dialogue about, ideally, if, if you weren't constrained by those factors, how would you collect it or how are you using those data? Uh, then they get more excited about the possibility of, of having their own data linked with other systems. If you can provide visibility into the data and people have access and, and can conduct self-service analytics, then that is a win for data governance because you can only facilitate those types of analytics if your data are well curated and documented and to some extent governed. Yeah, and if they know know the value. So in our last two minutes, I'm gonna to totally pivot um, to some fun things. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> I understand you're a runner, Dana. 
Where are you getting this information? (laughs) Social media. It's (laughs) Google your name. I saw you did a run with your family. So what's your favorite place to run? Okay. So the reason you Google my name and and all this running stuff comes up is because we have a a 5K, actually there's a 10K as well. It's a fundraising event for Moffitt Cancer Center called Miles for Moffitt. And I am the chair of the, or the co, uh, what do we call it? The captain of the Data Dashers team, which is a longstanding team. I bring my family every year. They know that it's very important to participate. And we really rally around the Data Dashers team. I've been participating in Miles for Moffitt annually for, since its inception, you know, going back more than 10 years. So all of those pictures you see of me are, at the Miles for Moffat event. I usually don't actually run it. I usually walk it. Truth be told, I register as a runner in case I want the option of running, but I usually end up walking with my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Walk, run. I'm going to have to send you a few of my cancer runs, one for St. Jude's and one for um, some of the 9-11 survivors. Oh, um, that's great. But so I, I do... Picture- I do work out though. I just prefer, I like, uh, I like orange theory because you know why? And it's a tie back in the data. I love to see the distribution of my time spent in each of the five zones. And I try to optimize the, you know, normality of that distribution. So it, it really speaks to the data side of me. <laughs> okay. Well, now I'm really scared because I don't even know what orange theory is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mixing it up or? <laughs> no, it's a it's a, a chain of gyms, but they you, ah. you wear a heart rate monitor and you monitor your heart rate in real time. So talk about real time analytics. You can figure out how long you're spending in each of the five heart rate zones and, and, one of the stated goals is to have a fairly normal distribution. I actually kidded with them about building in a test for normality into their app, but I, I don't think it would have broad appeal. Okay. <laughs> so that's fascinating. I even, I gave my Fitbit away because I'm like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be tracked. I, I run enough. I work enough, but I don't want <laughs> too much data. Um so one of the other things that I, I like to ask people about, you know, we have so much to be grateful for, and we often think of just the routine answers. But if you think beyond the traditional answers, the canned answer, what are you most grateful for? Uh, well, yes. What I've been thinking about that a lot lately in quarantine, you know, and, and I think um, my answers are the same if they're just emphasized after the experience of the last six weeks. Um, One would be family. I'm most grateful for my family and getting to spend time with them in quarantine. You know, you keep reminding yourself that this is, I have an almost 14 year old daughter and this is a wonderful opportunity to spend more time with her than she probably wants. But in four years, I won't be able to. So I'm grateful for, for my family. And, and grateful for the work that I do. Um, you know, that sounds cheesy, but I'm very passionate about our mission at Moffitt. Uh, my own mother passed away when she was only 49 of cancer after battling it for over 20 years. I'm it's, sorry. It's a, uh, yeah. Well, you know, thank you. It, but she's my inspiration. She's what, why I do what I do every day. And honestly, when I leave my office and I walk past the long line of valet parking attendants, are people waiting to pick up their car at the at the valet parking attendant? I I think I, I look at the patients and their family members, and I'm immediately brought back to what it felt like when I was visiting my mother, or she was going through her care, and and it was already uh, 20 years ago that we lost her, and yet that those those feelings and those memories um, are still very fresh and poignant, and that's and that's what we do, and it's palpable when you come to Moffitt and you visit. Uh, our, our employees, our team members, everyone is there because we believe in our mission. So I'm so grateful to be at a place where we are mission driven and I'm blessed to work with so many wonderful people in the clinical research and administrative areas on, on advancing our mission. And so uh, I would say those are the two main things I'm grateful for uh, at this time. 
Thank you for the work you do, Dana. Thank you, Cindy. I appreciate it. And it's been delightful. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Data Chief. To learn more about today's guest, recommend a future guest, or listen to more of the show, head over to thedatachief.com. If you have questions for Cindy or comments about the episode, give her a shout on Twitter at BI Scorecard. The Data Chief is brought to you by our friends at ThoughtSpot. Searching through your company's data for insights doesn't have to be complicated. ThoughtSpot makes it easy. With ThoughtSpot, anyone in your organization can easily answer their own data questions, find facts, and make better, faster decisions. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com.